chapter forty four of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b arabia or life in the desert we have travelled from tabriz southward through persia to ispahan another of its chief trading and manufacturing cities and from there have gone by caravan to bushir the chief port on the eastern coast of the persian gulf here we cross that gulf to bahrain arabia and on the way visit the pearl fishing grounds from which more than a million dollars worth of pearls are taken every year the pearls come from pearl oysters which live far down on the bed of the sea the shells are gathered by arab divers who plug their ears and noses with cotton and tie heavy stones to their feet in order that they may the more easily remain under the water each diver has a belt around his waist to which a rope is attached he carries a basket which he fills with the oyster shells he then signals by pulling on the rope and is drawn to the surface the shells are now opened and the pearls taken out we watch the divers a while and then go on to the mainland of arabia and make our way down the coast to muscat the chief city of the province of oman where we get a ship which carries us to aden most of our travels through western persia were in the desert we have passed over tracts in eastern arabia which were all sand and stone and our journey in the indian ocean has been along barren shores we are now in arabia lying at anchor in a harbour surrounded by low ragged mountains which are all brown rock and white sand there is not a green tree or blade of grass to be seen and everything is brown gray or dazzling white this is typical of a great part of this country which is one of the chief desert lands of the world the city of aden itself is all white and brown the houses are mostly one-story buildings of sun-dried bricks covered with plaster and on the outskirts climbing the hills are huts as brown as the rocks upon which they stand everything seems dusty and dirty the hot dry air from the desert sweeps over our ship it parches our tongues and as soon as we land we look about for a drink of cool water we soon find that water is worth money in aden and that every one must pay for all he gets it rains but seldom and sometimes two years pass without a drop falling there is only one well in the city and most of the water comes from the ocean the sea water being turned into steam which when condensed is fresh water the machines for doing this belong to the british government which has control of the city it sells the water to the people reserving a certain amount for the british soldiers who are stationed here as we walk through the town we see long caravans of camels coming in and going out they are laden with wool dates and coffee and we are told that two hundred thousand of them come here every year camels form the chief means of transport over the deserts and if we would travel over them we must ride on these beasts and have soldiers on camels to guard us but before we go farther let us take a look at arabia it is one of the least known lands of the world and much of it is still unexplored it consists of a stony sandy peninsula lying between africa and the main body of asia being separated from africa by the red sea and from the remainder of asia in part by the long persian gulf through which we have sailed it has a coastline of more than four thousand miles but the winds are comparatively dry before they blow over it and the rainfall is almost as scanty as in any large region on earth the greater part of arabia is a high plateau surrounded by mountains beyond which bordering the red sea and extending down to the water is a long narrow plain which is yemen is exceedingly fertile the southern part of the plateau is almost sterile but there are fertile patches in oman and farther north and in the interior vast tracts fitted for the grazing of camels horses sheep and goats in the past it was thought that the whole plateau was a desert but recent explorations have shown that perhaps two-thirds of it may be used for grazing or farming there are no large rivers but many wadis or river beds which for the greater part of the year 
although dry on the surface have water flowing below them these underground streams are reached by wells and the wadis therefore form the chief caravan routes a part of northern arabia and of the coast along the red sea is nominally governed by turkey much of the western and southern coasts are subject to the british the latter nation through its government of egypt controls the peninsula of sinai and several important provinces along the red sea and aden belongs to it outright most of the country however is independent being inhabited by tribes of bedouins each ruled by its chief many of the bedouins are tent dwellers but some inhabit cities and they have many villages of mud or stone houses scattered here and there over the mighty plateau the arabs number altogether eight or ten millions they come from the same race as ourselves although their life and habits in the hot deserts of arabia have given them a different complexion some being almost as black as a negro they are a lean race tall and well formed and on the whole fine-looking they have straight black hair and black or brown eyes their faces are oval their noses aquiline and their eyes small and deep-set they are very proud but are polite good-natured and hospitable they seem to be distrustful of strangers and are ready to quarrel whenever occasion offers we may see arabs in aden and shall meet them everywhere as we travel over the peninsula here comes one now leading a camel his black face shining out in contrast to the white cotton gown which he wears his gown is open at the chest and bound round the waist with a girdle of leather he has also a goat's hair coat of black and white stripes which falls to his thighs and his head is covered with a bright yellow silk handkerchief tied on with a black woolen rope as thick as your thumb the rope is bound round his head again and again in such a way that the handkerchief covers a part of his forehead and neck and falls on his shoulders his feet are bare but they are protected from the hot road by sandals of wood behind the man walks a bedouin woman see how straight and fine-looking she is her face strange to say is not hidden and she is evidently proud of her necklace of silver and of the earrings of gold which half cover her cheeks her black face is tattooed her eyelashes darkened and her fingernails and toenails stained a bright red she wears a blue gown which falls to her feet and has a piece of dark blue cotton over her head other women we meet have on veils of various kinds and we learn that most of the women cover their faces when they go out of doors in some places they hide all but the eyes and in eastern arabia a thin black cloth serves as a veil the arabs are mohammedans whose women as we have already seen seldom go about with bare faces the inhabitants of arabia are divided into two classes those who live in tents and those of the towns and villages the tent dwellers are wandering tribes known as bedouins who live by rearing stock moving about with their sheep goats camels horses and asses from one grazing ground to another they are of many tribes each of which has its own district and is ruled by a chief they are the men of the desert and we shall find many of them also in the arid lands of syria farther north the bedouins are bold and as a rule are not friendly to strangers if we would travel with safety we must pay a tribute to the chiefs or sheiks to keep their subjects from robbing us and a powerful chief may send his soldiers along with us to protect our caravan from wandering bands on the way we stop now and then at one of the bedouin camps the tents are of homespun goat's hair or wool dyed black and woven into a coarse cloth by the women of the tribe the ordinary tent is seldom more than twenty feet long it is usually divided by a curtain into two rooms one for the women and children and the other for men there is but little furniture the ground serves as the table chair and bed of the family the cooking is done over open fires and all eat with their fingers millet and dates form the principal food the millet is ground between stones to a flour and made into cakes the dates come from the date palm of which there are many varieties they are eaten also by the horses and camels and even by dogs some of the tent dwellers raise a little wheat and barley but millet is the chief crop 
there are many children in these little tent villages they watch the flocks play with the horses and colts and roll about on the sand the babies are naked and the girls and boys wear no clothing until they are quite large we see children as old as ourselves who have on almost nothing their skins are dark brown or black and they shine under the tropical sun which is so hot that we feel like throwing off our clothes and playing as they do of all the stock kept by the bedouins the camels are most interesting and especially the camel colts which are still with their mothers they are ungainly little creatures and when we chase them they run off at great speed the bedouin boys tell us that some camels are slow and some fast there are riding camels and freight camels the riding animals are for travelling they make six or more miles an hour and some will go seventy-five miles in one day the freight camels are used to transport goods over the country they go about three miles or less in one hour but each will carry three hundred pounds camels are especially fitted for work in the desert their stomachs are such that they can store away enough water at one drinking to last for a week and are therefore able to traverse the long distances in these sandy wastes where no water is to be had arabian horses are among the finest known to the world and the best of them are produced in the province of Najid on the central plateau the arabian horse is not as large as the average american horse and we have many race horses which can go faster than any arabian these horses however are so beautifully formed and are so noted for their kindness endurance and other good qualities that every one wants them they are usually gray in color although some are chestnut sorrel or black reared in the desert they become accustomed to go long distances without water and it is said that a desert-bred steed will travel a whole day and night in the summer and about twice as long in the winter without either water or food we find that the bedouins think much of their horses they keep them staked near their tents and allow them to run about everywhere they treat them so kindly that they seldom become vicious the children are allowed to play with them and they are really made a part of the family the horses are ridden with halters being guided this way and that by a pressure of the knee End of chapter forty four chapter forty five of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b in an arabian village mecca and medina today we shall see something of the cities and villages of arabia the cities are small most of them small settlements along the coastal plain of the red sea and in oman at the southeastern end of the peninsula by far the largest are mecca and medina in western arabia these two cities were the homes and chief preaching places of the prophet mohammed and for that reason are considered so holy by the mohammedans all over the world that they go there to worship in crowds every year we shall first visit the villages they are to be found in such places as contain considerable tracts of cultivable land they are everywhere of much the same character the houses are seldom of more than two stories and the most of them of but one story only they are built of mud bricks or of stones put together with mortar they have flat roofs and are often surrounded by walls each village is cut up by winding streets and it has a market-place in the centre about which are the shops where the people come together to trade the shops are often kept by women and but little else than food is sold in them but suppose we pay a visit to a high-class arab his house is exceedingly rude although it is somewhat better than that of the average native there are no windows facing the street and the door is so low that we must stoop to go in entering we come into the gentleman's parlor where all male guests are received if we should stay overnight we may sleep in this room on the floor our host is well to do and his home has some furniture the floor is covered with rugs and there are cushions here and there upon which we sit in oriental fashion with our legs crossed at one end of the room is the fireplace where a brass coffee-pot steams as soon as we are seated 
our host claps his hands and a servant offers each of us a cup no larger than half an eggshell it is filled with a brown fluid so thick that it looks more like molasses than coffee the steam rises as the coffee is poured from the pot and we blow it a little to cool it we then sip it slowly enjoying the delicious aroma this country is one of the homes of the coffee plant and the famed mocha which is considered about the best of all coffee on earth comes from a city of that name in yemen arabia we find our friends hospitable and remain with them until evening as the night approaches dinner is served and we sit down around the meal on the floor the food consists of thin wheat cakes baked to a crisp in an oven and a stew of camel's flesh at great feasts a sheep or lamb may be roasted and this is brought in whole to the guests we eat with our fingers picking the meat out of the stew with pieces of cake which we double up for the purpose when we have finished the stew dates and other fruits and sweets are brought in and after that a basin of water is passed round and every one washes his hands now a boy brings a covered bowl in which incense burns he sways this about each guest in order that he may perfume his face hands and clothes we have no wine at the meal the arabs are mohammedans and they do not believe it is right to drink anything which intoxicates as we go on with our travels stopping at one village after another visiting with the people in their tents and houses we come to like them very much they are cleanly as to their persons they bathe often and take such care of their teeth that they shine out like rows of ivory made whiter by the darkness of their complexions we observe that the men and boys shave their heads and that they wear fez caps or large turbans the arabs have bright minds although the schools are few and not many of the people can read or write the teaching is mostly confined to the Quran or Mohammedan Bible, and the sheikhs or the priests are the teachers. Nevertheless, a long time ago, the Arabs were among the most learned men of the world. They had the best doctors and were famous as astronomers and mathematicians. It was they who introduced the study of algebra into Western Europe, and for a long time they were noted for their geographical knowledge. But suppose we take a look at Mecca where mohammed was born arabia as we have already learned is altogether a mohammedan country it was long the seat of the mohammedan religion and mecca as the birthplace of their prophet is still holy to the many millions of that faith they consider it so sacred that whenever they say their prayers they kneel down with their faces towards it and this is so whether they be in java china india africa or in any other part of the world indeed mecca is considered so holy that strangers are not allowed to visit it and it is only through those who have gone there in disguise and described it that we know much about it it is a town of fifty thousand or more lying in the interior of the country almost seventy-five miles east of the red sea one way of reaching it is by the port of jidda from where the people go in by camels or on foot and another is by a railroad which the mohammedans have recently built from damascus down through the desert by the way of medina the great site at mecca is the sacred mosque which contains the kaaba a little building in its centre which is supposed to be especially holy and also a black stone which according to their tradition fell down from paradise when adam was thrust out of the garden of eden the mohammedans believe that when they kiss this stone their sins pass away as their lips touch the rock they tell us that when the stone fell to earth it was whiter than snow but that having been kissed by the people through so many generations their sins have gone into it and turned it jet black the character of the stone shows it to be of meteoric origin and we know that there are similar ones in other parts of the world medina where mohammed was buried is much less than mecca in size and is not considered so sacred it is surrounded by a wall forty feet high but the streets are narrow and dirty and the houses are flat roofed and of two stories only the tomb of the prophet lies inside a great mosque which covers a space of almost three acres End of chapter forty five
chapter forty six of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b asiatic turkey in palestine and mesopotamia our next journeys are to be devoted to the many curious countries of asiatic turkey including syria mesopotamia armenia and asia minor lying west of persia and north of arabia and bounded on the north and west by the black and mediterranean seas these countries comprise a territory more than ten times the size of the state of ohio and some parts of them are thickly populated they have altogether about sixteen million inhabitants including many different peoples and tribes there are turks arabs syrians greeks armenians and jews all of whom we shall see as we go on with our travels asiatic turkey is governed by the sultan who lives at constantinople in europe and who rules it through the governors and local officials the land is one of mountains and tablelands with several valleys and plains of wonderful fertility it has some large rivers such as the euphrates and tigris which have been famous as far back as man can remember it was in the valleys of the tigris and euphrates known as mesopotamia that the ancient cities of nineveh and babylon stood and many men think that there was the place where the tower of babel was started baghdad of which we have read so much in the arabian nights stands on the tigris and in the western part of asiatic turkey are damascus and jerusalem and the lands of the bible if we should cross arabia by caravan to mesopotamia and visit baghdad we should find that it is still a thriving city with bazaars much the same as when harun el rashid ruled there and did we go down the tigris and the euphrates we should travel through many rich irrigated farms including some of the largest date groves of the world the date palms number hundreds of thousands and they annually yield enough fruit to give every man woman and child in our country three pounds and leave some to spare the fruit is picked from the trees and packed up in bags or wooden boxes in which it is sent to bazora the port at the head of the persian gulf and from there to the united states to europe and indeed all over the world we shall find it much easier however to continue our journey northward through the red sea and the suez canal to port said on the mediterranean from where almost every night ships sail for jaffa in palestine the journey is a short one and when we awake in the morning we are at anchor in front of a ragged white and gray town built upon the rocks on the very edge of the sea we have trouble in landing for the water is rough but we finally get to the shore where we take the railroad train for jerusalem which lies about forty miles distant in the judean mountains the ride is delightful we first go through the orange groves for which jaffa is famous and then cross the flat plains of sharon where the philistines live we next climb the mountains passing over the country where samson was born and farther on see where little david had his fight with goliath the plains of sharon are fertile and the grass is as green as that of our country in june the sides of the roads and the borders of the fields are covered with great beds of poppies the flowers of which are as big as the palm of one's hand and as red as fresh blood in some places the farmers are ploughing they wear white gowns and turbans and use ploughs made of two sticks of wood fastened to a yoke which rests on the necks of the camels or donkeys the farmer holds the plough with one hand and carries a long goad or stick with the other with which he pokes up the beasts as they travel the furrows as we climb the hillsides we see many shepherds watching their flocks of white sheep and black goats and in some of the wheat fields see girls picking out the weeds known as tares it takes us about an hour to reach the country where the israelites lived and the road then winds in and out among rocky mountains we pass groves of olive trees and climbing ever higher and higher at last arrive at the little plateau upon which jerusalem stands we are now about twenty five hundred feet above our starting place at jaffa on the edge of the sea and in front of one of the most famous and interesting places of the whole world 
before we enter jerusalem let us take a bird's-eye view of palestine we knew that it was a small country but we did not realize how very small it is on the average palestine is not more than fifty miles wide and it is just about one hundred and fifty miles long were it level a high-power automobile could cross it in one hour and if the road ran lengthwise one might start at eight o'clock in the morning at dan which lies at the north in the foothills of the lebanon mountains and by noon he could be at beersheba at the extreme southern end and on the edge of arabia the country is so small that standing on the mount of olives outside jerusalem one can if the day be bright see the mediterranean on one side of him and the dead sea and the jordan on the other the land is for the most part a low mountainous range covered with limestone and much of it is so barren and rocky that it cannot be cultivated on the east is a deep valley in which lie the dead sea and the sea of galilee connected by the winding river jordan and on the west is a narrow coastal plain another plain or valley crosses the country from the lower end of the sea of galilee to the mediterranean the jerusalem of to-day is large it contains altogether eighty or ninety thousand people more than half of whom live inside a great wall which runs around most of the town skirting the edges of a little plateau the walls are of yellow limestone taken from the quarries near by they are beautifully made rising to the height of a four-story house on three sides of the plateau the ground slopes from the walls down into valleys at an angle so steep that it is almost impossible to climb up except on your hands and knees the fourth side of the city faces the plain we can see that a place so situated could be easily defended and that this was one of the reasons why the israelites chose this site for their capital but let us take a look at the city inside the walls the space is covered with box-like stone houses built one on top of the other in all sorts of shapes the houses are crowded along narrow streets which wind this way and that above them here and there rises the spire of a church and in one corner are about thirty-five acres where stands an immense building with a green dome of bronze that is the mosque of omar it is on the site of solomon's temple and under it scientists suppose the ruins of the temple to be in the centre of jerusalem high above the mass of stone boxes may be seen another great dome it crowns the church of the holy sepulchre and is supposed to cover the spot where jesus was crucified it is there that pilgrims from many parts of the world come to worship and there is kept the marble tomb in which as the oriental christians believe the body of jesus was laid we are surprised at the meanness and squalor of jerusalem it is made up of narrow streets walled with houses more closely packed together than those of any other city of the world the buildings are swarming with people there are families of jews greeks and armenians each living in one room so small indeed that it would be thought hardly large enough for a bedroom in america many of the rooms have no windows and some are like vaulted caves and are lighted only at the front most of the buildings are walled floored and sealed with stone sometimes they are built around courts upon which the rooms open and in such cases the people often cook in the courts because there is no space left inside the house the roofs of these jerusalem houses are flat and not a few of them are covered with grass at night they form the loafing places of the families and in the summer the people sleep there we see no chimneys the fuel most commonly used is charcoal which makes but little smoke but let us take a walk through the streets we shall find them quite as queer as the houses in some places they are like tunnels being roofed over by the second stories of the buildings and walled on each side by what seem to be long lines of vaulted caves these caves are shops or stores which open right out upon the street they are not large enough for the customers to enter and hardly big enough for the turbaned merchant to turn around inside them indeed it looks to us as though jerusalem might have been made by the descendants of the cave dwellers this cave-like character prevails also in the villages of palestine many being cut out of the hills which form the back walls of the houses what a variety of faces we see on the streets 
there are men here from all parts of the turkish empire there are pilgrims by the thousand from russia and greece and visitors from every country of christendom let us climb to the roof of one of the houses and look down on the crowd which passes below that dark-faced bearded man in a long brown and white gown with a yellow handkerchief covering his head is a bedouin we can see the black rope tied round the kerchief and he reminds us of the camel guards we had in arabia next to him is a shepherd from bethlehem in a coat of sheepskin below which a white gown falls to the feet he has his daughter with him and we see that her face is as fair and her features as regular as our own she wears a gown of red and green silk and has on a cap covered with rows of gold coins that cap contains her dowry and it shows how much money she will bring to her husband when married as we look little droves of donkeys laden with grain pass beneath us and men from the desert come in upon camels there are also many russian pilgrims on foot the men wear long coats and trousers and boots which come to the knees the women are clad in short gowns and high boots there are also armenians and greeks some of whom wear clothing like ours some have skull caps of red felt known as the fez and others wear turbans we see christians from abyssinia with faces like jet and men from northern europe with cheeks as fair as our own there are also many mohammedans but it is impossible to tell who they are for their dress does not indicate their religion there are some however whose faith we cannot mistake i refer to the jews they have olive-brown faces curved noses and their features are usually strong the men all wear beards and two long curls of hair one of which hangs down in front of each ear they wear cloth gowns or coats that come almost to the feet and many of them have caps bound round with a fur that sticks out like the quills of a mad porcupine the jewish women wear bright colored dresses and shawls upon which flowers are embroidered or printed we can tell them also by their bare faces the mohammedan women being always veiled when they go out on the street leaving jerusalem we take horses and ride all day to the eastward over the hills to the valley of the jordan we descend into the valley and follow the course of the river to where it empties into the dead sea we are now on the shore of the lowest body of water on earth the dead sea lies thirteen hundred feet below the level of the ocean and it has no perceptible outlet its waters are far more salty than the ocean containing so much mineral matter that if you should boil down a tumbler full one-fourth of the contents would be found to be salt they are so heavy that when we go in for a swim we find that we cannot possibly sink we bob up and down like a cork and if we move our feet seem to be thrown to the surface the dead sea is not large its length is only forty-seven miles and its width not more than ten climbing back up to jerusalem we make our way northward through a hilly country into samaria and thence to galilee to visit nazareth where the boyhood of jesus was spent it is a little town in the mountains surrounded by green fields and beautiful flowers we enjoy ourselves a while there playing with the children who are noted for their beauty and then go on eastward to the sea of galilee we stop on the way to visit the spot where jesus is said to have preached the sermon on the mount and then have the fishermen take us out in their boats the water is now smooth and the scenery delightful we remain a day at tiberius and then cross the sea to the railroad on which we ride to damascus End of chapter 46chapter forty seven of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b travels among the turks damascus is one of the oldest cities of the world its origin is not known but it was a thriving commercial centre in the times of abraham and david it is an oasis city lying on the edge of the syrian desert in a large tract of fertile soil which is irrigated by two rivers from the lebanon mountains it now has several hundred thousand inhabitants and its vast bazaars are filled with fine goods 
we visit the shops and make excursions into the country near by looking at the great orchards of oranges lemons and figs we watch the caravans of camels coming in from persia and elsewhere and later take the railroad for a trip over the mountains to the thriving mediterranean port of beirut from beirut we steam northward to smyrna a commercial centre with many greek citizens and then go through asia minor into armenia and other parts of asiatic turkey we observe that the country has much wasteland it has some forests on the mountains and is rich in minerals but only a few good mines have been opened the chief business of asia minor is farming but the tools are of the rudest description most of the crops are cut with a sickle and near each little town is a threshing floor upon which the grain is trodden out by oxen or donkeys the farms are usually small and the owners are compelled to pay the government a part of the crop in many places the soil is exceedingly fertile producing grain of all kinds as well as cotton tobacco and opium about smyrna and elsewhere are orchards from which quantities of fine figs are exported to america and europe and we find oranges olives almonds grapes and nuts almost everywhere we can buy smyrna figs in our grocery stores in the mountains are mulberry groves and the people rear silkworms and export their cocoons they also weave many fine silks asia minor is noted for its excellent wool the plateaus are covered with a rich grass upon which large flocks of sheep and goats are fed this is the home of the angora goat whose wool called mohair is about the finest known we watch the people of the villages weaving the goat's hair and sheep's wool into rugs just as we saw them doing in persia they work in their homes on rude looms before which they kneel or sit cross-legged several are often employed upon a single rug each taking a section of the pattern the fine rugs are made entirely by hand the tufts of wool being tied together and fastened to the threads without the aid of the shuttle such rugs are as soft as the best of our machine-made carpets and their colors are better a good workman can weave only three or four square inches a day and a hearth rug of the best quality requires months of continuous labor but let us visit some of the farm villages the farmers live in little houses of stone or sun-dried brick the roofs are flat and the windows are mere holes in the walls in armenia the houses are often built either wholly or partly under the ground an excavation is made in the side of a hill and the building is so erected within it that one can hardly tell it is there unless he sees it from the front such houses are usually of one story and their flat roofs are often covered with two or three feet of earth on which the grass grows there are no fences about the roofs and the cattle and sheep may be seen grazing on the very tops of the houses the floor is often below the level of the ground and we have to step down to get in upon entering we find a cow stable on one side and on the other a room which forms the kitchen parlor and sleeping place of the family it is cold in armenia during the winter and these cave-like homes are easily warmed the village people have but little furniture the possessions of many a family consisting of only a straw mat which covers the floor a rude chest for the clothes a few copper vessels and some stone water jars the cooking is done over open fireplaces or in ovens of clay or stone the meals are served on the floor and fingers take the places of knives and forks the cities of turkey have some large and comfortable homes there are many rich and well-to-do people in whose houses there are separate quarters for the women and men the men guests never being admitted to those parts where the women live in the better class houses the quarters of the women are often guarded by servants the women are not allowed to go upon the street without so concealing themselves in blue or black cloaks that they look as though they were walking about inside so many balloons in addition to these garments the woman covers her face with a veil so thick that her features are hidden indeed a boy may pass his mother on the street and not know her and a man could hardly recognize his wife if he saw her out shopping while at home the women wear jackets and very full trousers their feet are either bare 
or clad in slippers of soft bright colored leather turkish gentlemen usually wear shirts and full pantaloons and over them gowns which reach from the neck to the feet in the cities some dress as we do the poorer classes and those out in the country have only full trousers and a jacket much like a roundabout the trousers are tied at the ankles and the men's shoes are without heels and turned up at the toes the jackets are often embroidered with silver and gold the turks are cleanly as to their persons and the men and boys have their heads shaved with the exception of a lock on the crown they wear skull caps or turbans which they keep on while in the house the boys and girls do not come together at parties and the men and women are always apart husbands and wives do not eat together all marriage arrangements are made by parents who often make the engagements when their children are still babies boys are usually married while in their teens and as the girls approach twenty years of age they are considered old maids these people are not very well educated but new schools are being started and now there are several thousands scattered over the empire the mohammedan priests are often the teachers and the mosques are sometimes the schoolhouses in such schools the boys sit on the floor holding their books on their knees or in their hands they have no desks nor chairs they study out loud swaying back and forth as they sing out the verses they are trying to commit to memory the chief studies are the turkish language and the koran or mohammedan bible they also have some arithmetic geography and history almost every man knows how to read education is free and the schools are under government control the laws provide that all children must be educated but in many districts such laws are not enforced and the people are ignorant within recent years however great changes have been going on in turkey the government is being reformed and the taxes reduced railroads are planned to open up the most important parts of the country and in time many improvements will probably be made for ages turkey has been an absolute monarchy ruled by the sultan but a few years ago a parliament was elected and from now on the people will make their own laws and to a great extent govern themselves end of chapter forty seven chapter forty eight of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b russia in asia transcaucasia turkestan and the steppes our last journeys are to be in the vast provinces of asia belonging to russia of all nations the russians are the largest landholders they own about one-seventh of all the land upon earth and their possessions in asia cover more than one-third of that continent siberia is one-third greater in extent than the whole of the united states including alaska and the russian provinces which lie south of western siberia and north of afghanistan persia and turkey have altogether an area equal to one-half that of our country these vast territories are for the most part thickly settled the southwestern provinces are largely made up of deserts and northern siberia is as cold and bare as northern alaska the countries are so vast that we shall travel rapidly over them stopping only at such places as have to do with the commerce and work of the world we begin our explorations in transcaucasia a beautiful little country which is bounded on the north by the caucasus mountains it is only about four times as large as the state of pennsylvania but it has over eleven million people and is by far the most thickly settled province of asiatic russia the soil is rich producing grain cotton rice and tobacco and such fruits as grapes figs peaches and almonds the people are of several races and we meet everywhere georgians armenians and russians the georgian men wear long robes pantaloons high boots and cone-shaped caps of black wool their robes are belted in at the waist they have rows of cartridges upon their breasts and pistols in their belts many of them carry swords and they impress us by their fierce looks the georgian women are so beautiful that the richer turks come here for their wives indeed there was once a regular business of buying and shipping these girls to constantinople 
but this is now contrary to law although some are still sold and smuggled out of the country these women have fair rosy complexions black hair large eyes and white teeth they are slender with small hands and feet most of them can dance well and many play upon the tambourine and guitar they wear gowns much like those of our country but their headdress consists of a small round cap over which is thrown a white silk or lace handkerchief tied under the chin we start at batum on the black sea and from there go by rail to baku on the caspian the road runs through the mountains passing tiflis the capital a large and well fortified city at batum we see many tank steamers loading petroleum on the railroad we go by long trains of tank cars and at baku find ourselves surrounded by huge oil tanks tall derricks and great pumping works which remind us of the oil regions of california texas or pennsylvania the land here is underlaid with beds of petroleum and there is a vast industry in raising the oil and shipping it to russia and other parts of the world the russian oil although by no means so abundant as ours is our chief competitor in the foreign markets much of it is carried in tanks or in pipes to batum and thence over the black sea into the mediterranean whence it goes to the various countries of europe asia and africa at baku we find a steamer which takes us across the caspian sea and lands us on the opposite shore where we get the trans-caspian railroad which carries us more than a thousand miles eastward into the heart of central asia both the engines of the steamer and those which pull our cars use petroleum as fuel we travel for miles through deserts visiting now and then an oasis or a fertile spot where the land is cut up by irrigating canals and where every drop of water is saved to feed the dry soil we pass through kiva and bokhara little countries ruled by kings or emirs subject to russia the people are tartars and they look not unlike the turks they are chiefly farmers raising wheat rice barley cotton tobacco and silk we find delicious peaches melons and grapes the railroad takes us through vast fields of cotton whose product is now competing with ours in the markets of russia we see also wandering tribes who have flocks and herds of goats sheep horses and camels they dwell in round tents which they move about to the best feeding grounds they have also cities and villages this region was the original home of the turks from where they moved westward to the mediterranean sea there are several other races in bokhara however and on the whole the people look very strange caravans of camels bring loads of freight to the stations and we see men riding about on horses and camels the villages and cities are dirty and squalid the houses are made of mud bricks and even the railroad stations are mud we visit the oasis of merv and crossing the great river amu go on to bakara and samarkand through a fertile irrigated country cut up by countless canals the land rises as we journey on toward the east we reach the pamir which is one of the highest countries of the world and then move northward over a plateau through russian turkestan on our way to siberia our train takes us by tashkend on to the great body of salt water known as the aral sea and thence across the kirghiz steppes where we meet the tartar herders and shepherds who form its inhabitants they are known as kirghiz they are one of the nomad races of asia numbering more than three millions their country is about one-third as large as russia in europe the kirghiz have vast herds of camels sheep horses and cows they dwell in circular tents covered with felt and move about from one pasture field to another they are proud of being stock breeders rather than farmers these people remind us of our american indians and also of the tartars north of the great wall of china they have high cheekbones small oblique eyes and skin the color of copper both men and women wear yellow or red leather trousers and over them a long robe much like a dressing gown the trousers and robe are tied in by a belt at the waist in addition to these garments the women have a close-fitting shirt they are fond of jewelry and paint and powder their faces braiding ribbons and horsehair into their hair to make it seem longer the kirghiz have many odd customs 
girls are usually wedded at fifteen or younger and the groom has to pay for the bride giving her parents a certain number of sheep horses or camels before the marriage takes place a poor and rather homely girl is often sold for one or two camels but a beautiful rich one may bring as much as fifty camels or one hundred sheep among these people the wife does the most of the work she puts up and takes down the tents and loads them upon the camels when the tribe moves to a new feeding ground she aids in watching the stock and is expected to do all the milking this is a great task for not only the cows but also the sheep goats and mares are milked the cows sheep and goats are milked only morning and evening but the mares are milked three times a day one of their chief dainties is kumis which comes from mare's milk it is a liquor made by putting the milk into a leather bag and keeping it there for about two weeks during which time it is frequently shaken it soon ferments producing a drink which tastes somewhat like buttermilk but which will intoxicate one if he takes over much end of chapter forty eight chapter forty nine of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b russia in asia siberia we are travelling this morning on the great trans-siberian railroad we reach it at chelyabinsk a station which is sometimes called the western gate to siberia it is situated on the eastern slope of the ural mountains being surrounded by groves of birch trees it has railroad shops round houses for engines and manufacturing establishments a few hours after our arrival we bought tickets for vladivostok and return and we are now coming back from a trip over this the longest continuous line of railroad in the whole world the road is more than five thousand miles long and with its asiatic and european connections many thousand miles longer it extends from the ural mountains to the pacific ocean and from harbin manchuria a branch line goes south to mukden and to dayren on the yellow sea the latter is sometimes called the chinese eastern railroad it connects at mukden with the railroads of china and korea so that one can now go by the trans-siberian to peking or to fusan on the lower end of the korean peninsula from where a few hours by ferry will put him on the japanese railroads the trans-siberian railroad is one of the chief trade routes of asia it carries to europe much of the tea silk and other products which were formerly transported by sea it has many passengers for by it one can go from peking to london in less time than he can cross the pacific and besides there is no seasickness to fear our journey is comfortable the train carries first and second class compartment cars which have excellent beds we have a dining car whose tables are supplied with fresh fish from the pacific ocean and from lake baikal and the many rivers we cross we have excellent butter and eggs from the farms near the stations and also beef pork mutton and chicken as well as venison wild duck and other kinds of game going eastward during the first part of our travels we cross a cheerless plain spotted with salt lakes and marshes the steppes of western siberia here the country is much like that of the kirghiz which we have just left we stop a while at omsk on the Irtish river and thence ride on to tomsk on the ob river both are small but fast-growing cities inhabited by russians they have fine homes and good stores and are centers of trade crossing the ob on a bridge a half mile long we travel more than eleven hundred miles farther to Irkutsk on the angara about two hours from lake baikal here in almost the centre of southern siberia is another large city with banks stores hotels libraries and schools the place is lighted by electricity and its streets are wide and well paved we stop over a train to fish in lake baikal it is one of the deepest bodies of fresh water known it is twice as large as lake ontario and more than half again as large as lake erie the country about is covered with forests but east and west of it are vast plains some of which are already settled by farmers there are extensive grasslands and great fields of wheat 
there are many villages of log cabins put up by the russians who go out from them to their work in the fields we are told that they hold the lands in common and that the elders of the towns divide the various tracts among the people year after year we find more settlements as we go eastward and at vladivostok see the chief russian seaport on the pacific it is a slice of russia in asia containing a mixed population of about fifty thousand russians it has a regiment or so of russian soldiers and also many koreans and chinese the streets are filled with long-bearded men wearing black caps thick coats and full pantaloons which are stuck inside their high leather boots we ride about the town in droshkis drawn by black horses which gallop like mad we do not speak russian and we motion the drivers which way to go we visit the chinese and korean parts of vladivostok and now and then meet one of the aborigines or natives descendants of those who were the only inhabitants of siberia before the russians came they look much like our eskimos having copper-colored skin slant eyes thick lips and flat noses among them are the buryats from about lake baikal the latter are full of superstition and when one of them dies they kill a horse in order that its spirit may carry him safely and comfortably through the land of the hereafter they are fond of tobacco and we see children of eight or nine years with pipes in their mouths equally odd are the tunguses who come from the valley of the amur and parts farther south most of them are hunters who roam through the woods without tents dwelling in caves or hollow trees they have reindeer and they travel from one part of the country to another on sledges they are fond of the animals and rear them for sale vladivostok is one of the seats of government of siberia it has many officials who know all about the country and from them we learn much concerning these vast regions which have been so little explored the land as a whole is an irregular plain which slopes from the highlands of asia towards the north ending at the arctic ocean this plain is made up of three great belts the first along the edge of the ocean is bleak and treeless and is frozen for the most of the year it is swampy in summer but during the winter the arctic ocean freezes for hundreds of miles from the shore and one might ride there for days over the snow without knowing where the land ended and the sea began this is the home of the reindeer polar bear and black fox it is the land of long days and long nights where during midwinter there is nothing but darkness and where the midsummer is one long long day when the sun never sets south of this icy region is a belt of almost impenetrable forest filled with wild boars wolves and other fur-bearing animals here are found sables worth more than their weight in silver and ermine whose beautiful white skins were formerly used to line the cloaks of kings the third belt is that through which we have been traveling in many respects it is like our far northern states or the wheat belt of western canada its winters are long but in the summer the nights are so short that the crops have enough sunshine to make them mature this belt contains rich farming land and it is being gradually settled as we have seen from the many villages and towns through which we passed on our journey the climate is healthful and it will some day support many millions of people the officials we meet tell us that the resources of siberia are by no means confined to its farms the land contains all sorts of minerals in almost every district gold is known to exist there are valuable mines of gold quartz in the altai and ural mountains and along the northern coasts thousands of men are at work digging up the frozen land and melting it with fires to wash out the gold nuggets weighing as much as a quarter of a pound have been found and the grains on the average are larger than those of any other part of the world siberia has plenty of coal and there is one iron mine in the ural mountains which is said to contain about two billion tons of fine ore the country has silver copper nickel and lead and salt and petroleum as well the forests of siberia are extensive and valuable and its great rivers the ob yenisei lena abound in fine fish indeed it is almost impossible to appreciate the wealth of this great land and to think what it may become in the future 
we conclude our travels by returning to chelyabinsk from where we get a direct railroad line to moscow and warsaw from warsaw a fast train takes us to paris and we spend a day or so at the french capital after that we travel across the english channel to london thence go to southampton and one of the largest of the ocean greyhounds brings us over the atlantic to dear old new york end of chapter forty nine end of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter